Today, I did want to talk a little bit about agile development for engineering software. It's, it's kind of a mouthful, if, we, if we'll be honest. Uh, so agile development, everybody kind of understands. But, you know, and even part of my experience, I've always been in, the, in a world of where we develop software, not for end users, not for web applications, but for engineers, right? The, the end users of our products are engineers. And so, you know, sometimes the nature that the, the work that we do in the software that we develop is high complexity, you know, things that are pretty difficult and very challenging. Um, so what I wanted to really talk about today is how does agile development work in this context? And, and most importantly, independent of where you are at, I mean, maybe some of you guys are already doing agile development and are, 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 are uh, mature in that. Um, some of you may be in the midst of the change like we are, and some of you may even just be considering it. What is really important and the big takeaways that we wanted to have for you today is that, okay, A, it's not easy. Like, I'm not gonna be coming here and telling you this is a breeze and you know, it's all wonderful. You just do it and, and you know, that's not true. That's not a reality. Um, it does take hard work and persistence. You know, you have to work at it hard and you have to keep on working at it because, you know, if you work at it hard for a little while, you know, you're eventually going to lose uh, wind in your sails and, you know, you're going to stop it. And that's actually the worst position in which you can be in, in which you, you start to do the transition and you don't pull it through. But at the end of the day, you know, it can be done. Uh, I've been through two successful ones. This is now my third transition that I'm going through. It can be done and it really pays off. And that's something that hopefully I can, through the examples and kind of as we walk through this, uh, you know, make motivate you to, to believe in that as well. So let's, um, let's take a look at the agenda. Let's see if I can figure out how to click forward. There we go. So really, you know, I'm going to walk you through three, you know, the big chapters that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about Agile. I don't want to be doing a training. I'm sure most of you have heard about it. Probably could be people on this call that know much more than I do, but really just to kind of go back to the principles. What does that all really mean? Um, then we're going to take a look at the challenges because, you know, there, there's challenges of many natures, but really the focus on the challenges I'm going to have on today is the internal challenges, right? They say, okay, we want to move to agile. Great. We're going to have challenges in the company. We're going to have challenges in the product, but we also have challenges even with our engineering group in that transition. And then, you know, I want to share with you a little bit of what we've done at TechSoft, you know, the, the progress that we're making and, and some of the benefits that we've seen so far uh, in terms of the changes. So let's take a look at the, the being agile. And really what I'm going to focus on is the agile values. So, um, the, there was a group of people that created what they call the Agile Manifesto. It's based on four core values. Um, and really those values uh, are supposed to, you know, guide people in developing what they call an Agile mindset for software developers. And the first one that they talk about, uh, and, and most of their, their values are, are kind of positioned in this way. They, they put something that they want to favor in detriment of something else. So it, it doesn't mean you, you don't do the other thing. It just means that you should be privileging and favoring and uh, one side of things. And in this particular case, they say, you know, we should be favoring individuals and their interactions over just using tools and processes and be, you know, being very strict on the tools that we use and the processes that we use. And you know, if I can provide an example, you know, that we have at TechSoft or we had, you know, we're working on improving where we see this is, for example, silos. You know, everybody I think can understands what it is in terms of software engineering or engineering silos. Um, you know, people that have you know particular expertise, and you try to channel work. Uh, you know, of those people or those teams to that particular silo. Um, where was this really hurting us? Well, you know, if you think about development of a feature that needs to go through various expertises, it's hard to coordinate that work because. You need to have it in the hands of one expert and then it needs to hand, be handed off to the other expert and the other expert. And you know, you need to make sure that when it gets out of one person's hands that the other person is really ready to take that on because otherwise it's gonna be a sitting on a shelf. And so all of this coordination is something that's pretty difficult to do and something that you know, uh, has hurt us quite a bit. There's also this over, uh, overall lack of accountability, you know, and, I'll use the term cover my ass just to kind of entertain and humor this. It's not really the, the point that I'm trying to make here, but you know, if you're in a silo and you have a portion of work that you need to do and then you pass it off, you know, if something falls through the cracks or if something, you know, 
gets messed up along the process, you're going to say, hey, listen, you know, I did my thing, you know, it's somebody else's problem. And, and it is something that, you know, when it comes to delivering to our partners and our customers, you know, it's, it always puts us in a bad position. And of course, the third thing, you know, it's like, what if, when, what, if, what if somebody gets hit by the bus? You never want that to happen, but you know, people leave, you know, people go on to seek other opportunities. And when that happens and you, you have, you know, the, your team set up in silos, it puts you in a pretty comp difficult position. The second uh, value that is, uh, that is um, highlighted by the Agile Manifesto is the working software over exhausted documentation. Um, you know, again, to use an example that we see at TechSoft is, you know, all of the work that sometimes goes into analyzing something or trying to create a very detailed uh, um, design for, for something that you're, you're going to be doing well into the future. Um, all of that documentation and that upfront, upfront planning is expensive. You know, you need to put in the time to do it. Um, if you're not working on it immediately, it's documentation that becomes very obsolete or is difficult to maintain. So it's something that is unfavorable. Um, and the, there's another aspect, which is if you do a design today for something that you're going to implement in six months, when you look at it in six months from now, you're going to say, ah, you know what, I wouldn't do it in this way anymore because you've learned something new or because the reality has now changed. So all the work that we put into whether it's design, whether it's actually, you know, going in and trying to understand something to, to create an estimate because, okay, I need to know uh, how much time is this particular task going to do. This is work, this is time that ends up getting wasted unless you're immediately going to do that work. And, and that's something that with Agile, what they're saying is, okay, let's focus on working software. If I need to do analysis to, to do the work that I have in hands, do it, but don't do analysis for the next thing and the next, next thing. Okay, and let's then definitely don't hold around documentation for that purpose. Um, the third aspect, you know, uh, uh, Gavin touched on this very strongly is this customer collaboration. Um, you know, we, we definitely see that, for example, when you're doing a new feature development, you know, you, you settle on the contract of the, you know, this is something that traditionally we've seen, you settle on the contract of the thing that you wanna build right? Um, you know, what is the feature? What should it do? You go off and develop it. And what happens? You know, you go off, develop it for six months, you present it to the customer. What happens? They look at it and say, what the hell is that? That's not what I wanted. You know, this doesn't happen only at TechSoft. This happens all along. And, you know, when, when we talk about waterfall development, it's a classical situation that happens because, you know, you can't anticipate all of the things that the customer wants. Um, and so, how was this really hurting us? And, and this is, I, I think is gonna be something that I'm sure will resonate with most of you is, you know, you end up having developing a feature that does not meet the, the expectations of the user, or you end up doing a lot more work than you really needed to. This is one of the things that Agile really privileges is if you keep your customer in the loop, you will learn that in a lot of cases, things that you thought you needed to do, they don't really care about. So you end up being able to deliver something in some cases earlier than you expected you would deliver it, which is great. Um, I honestly believe that if you don't involve your customer, you're always gonna miss out on the best possible solution. I mean, we have bright minds, our engineers are bright, bright, bright minds, but you know, if you expose them to the customers and you allow them to get the information that the customers have to share, they're always gonna work on a better solution than they will find in isolation. And I, I'm a, a strong advocate of that. And that's why I think this is a key, uh, key component. And this is another key thing. And I know most of this is gonna resonate with most of you is what we end up developing when you work on a contract is what the customer asks for and not what the customer needs. And those are two different, very different things. Cause in a lot of cases they're gonna say, I'm gonna ask for everything because I wanna make sure that nothing gets missed. Whereas when you really dig into what they really need and you deliver on that, you know, you're going to really satisfy them a lot more. And so um, these are some of the things, uh, some of the aspects of customer collaboration, which I, I would highlight. And finally, the respond to change very closely related to the contract. Um, and one of the things that, uh, that um, often results from us not responding to change are what I'd like to call the unfinished features. Um, and again, let's think about the scenario. We're about to start a development of, of a new version or a new release. You put all the, the features that you want into that release. You start developing 
as you develop, as you materialize, you start showing it and people say, oh, well, we could do this or, you know what, that's not really the best solution. Or, it, or you say, you know, there's, we just need to do a little bit more to really make this thing shine. And guess what happens? Okay, well, we can't do that because if I do that extra work, it's not planned. I need to change the date or I need to change the scope. Oh, no, you can't do that. We have a contract. And so it always puts us in a situation where we do not meet the expectation of the user. And it's not that we didn't meet the original expectation, but now the user realized, you know, our stakeholders realized that the feature could actually be so much better. And this is frustrating because we know it could be better. The, the stakeholder knows it could be better. The customer knows it could be better. And, it, and honestly, you, what mostly happens is the customer knows it could be better that they actually then report the deficiency as a bug and not as a feature request. And so that really frustrates everybody because we didn't do what we knew we had to. And now we have a customer saying it's a bug in our product. So these are things that, you know, as we, as we embrace the, the agile change, um, you know, these are things that we, we should really be focusing on because they, you know, by addressing them, we really provide a lot of uh, benefit to, to our development process. So let's change the gears a little bit. Like I talked about Agile, you know, what they are really promoting in, in terms of their values. Some examples of, of how that really looks like in, in, in our reality. Well, what are some of the challenges you face? And really keep in mind that these are internal challenges. These are things that I hear, have some of my guys on this call, they're probably not happy with me because I'm calling them out, but you know, this is the reality. And to be honest, I don't really, intend to convey them in any blame, blameful way. This is just a reality. And one of them is, why can't I just work on the, the stuff that I like or want to do, right? And again, it's very closely related to this idea of the silos of you becoming an expert in something and saying, listen, really what I enjoy and really what I'm good at is this type of work. And you know what, they're totally right. You know, if I could just channel the work that they do the best, if I could just streamline and just to keep on feeding them, their individual throughput would be undeniably great, right? The reality is when you start to piece these things together and when you start to build products, you start to realize that you either go have problems with the scheduling or you have problems with things having to go back and forth because they did some work, but it was really not what you needed in the end, it needs to come back. We really do come to a point where from a company perspective, it's not the most efficient way, okay? so. We have to deal with the dependency of individuals, of scheduling back and forth, you know. And one other key thing is that you lose the autonomy of your roadmap. And think about it, you know, I'll use a, a completely, you know, outside example. Let's say you have a team of two people to build the house and one person can lay bricks and another can set windows. Well, if all of a sudden you take those two people and you don't have windows in your home, you're gonna have one person sitting around or you're gonna to have to put windows in your home because otherwise that person doesn't have work to do. I mean, it's a pretty drastic, uh, it's a pretty drastic example. What it does mean is that if you have people that are siloed in their work, in order, you either need to have them adapt or you need to be feeding them their work, which means you lose autonomy of your roadmap. The second is what I call this, build your castle effect, or why can't I build the, the, my castle? And this is just a natural tendency of us engineers, and I'm as blamed, you know, I can be as blamed as, as anybody else, I'm, or as guilty as anybody else is on this, is, you know, when you have a big problem to solve, you don't want to just problem, solve the problem at hand, you already want to anticipate the next thing that's coming and the next, next thing that's coming in, and want to think of your design of that. I mean, it's just natural for us engineers. Uh, you know, it's kind of like, I know you're going to be asking for me for this later. Well, what's the problem is, A, sometimes that later never comes, right? Sometimes that need that we think is going to come doesn't for many reasons. You know, maybe it's not a worthwhile investment. Maybe it's not a need of our customers. So we, are, we, we tend to sometimes design things that we don't need. And what's worse is that we tend to then have to maintain code uh, that does not serve a purpose. So we now we introduce a maintenance problem in, in our code base and that we have code that doesn't serve a purpose that we need to maintain. And it's something that's just bogging us down. The third thing was just related to something that I talked about earlier is that when the day comes in which that particular thing that we think we need in the future comes, guess what? We're further down the road. There's probably 
a better way to solve that problem than the way we solved it today, right? Because the reality is different and we've learned something new. Now, a lot of people at this point ask, oh, what about architecture? What about consistency? What about making sure that you have a, 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 you know, a, a code base that is actual and maintainable? I mean, at the core of Agile is the concept of redesign and refactoring. You know, it's, I know we want to push capability. I know we want to be agile, but there's some point at which you say, listen, I cannot add this capability to the source code because otherwise we're going to pay the, the price down, down the road. You're going to have to negotiate this with your PO and their PM and they're going to hate you. And you know, that does happen, but it does come at a cost. Not refactoring does come at a cost, but it is something that is considered as part of agile and it is a, a, a fundamental component. Okay. And this is the question that we all hate as engineers is when will it be done? And to be honest, the reason why this question is so inconvenient is that it is the, the one that triggers us to go anti-agile because, okay, agile is great. We, we, we take things, we talk to customers, we privilege interactions, we, we do things in small increments. And then somebody says, oh, what is this gonna be done? I, I don't know, I'm gonna be working on it in small increments until it's done, right? Um, and, but then people say, hey, I need to know when it's going to be done because I need to commit. And this is where things start to fall apart because it puts us in a direction, well, if I do need to commit and put a date on it, I need to design it. And then I need to document that design and I need to estimate everything that I design. And then I'm going to give you a date and I'm going to pad it. You know, exactly all of the things that Agile says that you shouldn't do, right? The reality is, all of those practices, the waterfall has proven that for software engineering and even in other engineering practices, it is inaccurate and you will normally not hit your dates, right? It's something that even with padding and even with all those things, you do not hit them and change is inevitable, right? And you need to find ways in which you can use Agile and Agile specifically with some of the, uh, with the frameworks with Scrum does provide you with some pretty powerful tools that allow you to estimate delivery not to the day, but in a way which is a lot more reliable than some of the practices that we would use traditionally. So again, you know, using this question as something that's going to stop you in terms of, of becoming agile is not something that we should, you know, uh, entertain. Okay, very well. I'm just trying to be cautious of time, making sure that we have plenty of time for the awesome demos that I also want to watch. So Let's talk a little bit about the things that we have done at TechSoft 3D. Um, so the first thing, uh, Gavin already touched on this a little bit. Uh, you know, I've been at TechSoft for two years. The Agile, the, the Agile and even adoption of Scrum started before me. Um, but one of the things that, that we, we did stop and, and look at when I came on board is, okay, let's see what we are doing in terms of Scrum and let's see some of the things that we can improve on. So for example, you know, we looked at, you know, being more diligent on our ceremonies, you know, our, our sprint planning, let's start thinking about how we plan our work and let's be more diligent about it. Let's be more methodical about it. Um, let's be diligent about our standup, focus on the goal in the standup, not necessarily on the tasks that you're doing. Okay, but what are we supposed to achieve as a team? Uh, looking at the review, starting to do our demos, let's start to show the changes that we do to our, the rest of our audience, to our stakeholders. And then the part of the retrospective, which is to say, okay, I need to improve. I need to make sure that I'm doing better the next time, you know, this continuous improvement component of the retrospective. So it's really, we took a deep look at that again, made some adjustments uh, to, to become more diligent on our ceremonies. Then we, we provided a bit more focus in terms of things like definition of ready. So is the work that we're about to do, is the work that's going into our sprint backlog ready to be done? Do the, does the engineering team understand what they need to accomplish? Okay, well, if it's not ready, let's not even bother take, tackling it because we know it's not gonna go well. Uh, definition of done, you know, when is work done? Now that I've actually started working on it, at what point can I say that it's done? Is it just when I do the code change? Is it just when it passes the tests? Is it when it gets validated by a customer? So defining that and making sure that we're diligent on that is important. Uh, using story points, you know, improving how we assess it, using them to calculate velocity, all those things that, you know, for example, are, are defined by Scrum. And one of the big things that we're really, we're trying to improve on, it's not easy. And, and you know, it's all of these things are things that are work in progress still. 
uh, defining your sprint goals. Like when you start to def- when you start to tackle sprint, what is really that I want to achieve at the end? It's not just about doing a bunch of tasks. It's not just about uh, you know completing a bunch of stories. It's about accomplishing a particular goal, and then that's going to be you know what's going to build your team collaboration, which is an essential piece of Scrum. Um, and then you know another change that we did was to really build teams around all the necessary competencies, not just in terms of the development skills and in terms of, you know, expertise and developers, but also introducing QA, you know, making sure that we have scrum masters within the team that are able to to coach the team in terms of good scrum practices, having the POs much more engaged and, and an active participant. We found that this has brought a lot of value. And again, I don't want to sell perfection here. We're in no way perfect. But we are starting to see that some of those changes are really uh, bringing us a lot of benefits. A more recent change that we've done is something that is, you know, been coined as the Spotify model. And we're we're taking our first steps into into adopting it. Um, And the Spotify model is really one which is trying to drive a team dynamic. Uh, which which pushes us into this quadrant. I'm sure everybody looking at that chart really understands, you know, if I have a team that has high or low autonomy or and, and has high or low alignment, you're going to get the most product productivity over somebody who's high autonomy and high alignment. Uh, I think that's a pretty easy concept to understand. With the Spotify model, what do, what do they actually do to achieve that? Well, one of one of the things that they do is they provide a mission to each one of the teams that they create, which they call squads. The squads are assigned a mission, and all of the work and their roadmap is in order to support that particular mission. It's not just about what we're doing, but what it is that we want to achieve in the longer term. So that's how they create this alignment. Everybody understands where they're headed in the long term, you know, in terms of the specific thing that they do. And in terms of the autonomy, what they do, other than the empowerment, which is natural of most agile, uh, uh, you know, mindsets or uh, frameworks, they really want to focus on end-to-end delivery of these of these squads. So making sure that they don't have downstream dependencies or upstream dependencies, and in that they can deliver something completely from beginning to end. Again, we're very, you know, this not is not just something that you 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 just put squads together to find a mission and it's all done. You know how you feed information, how you set them up in order to be able to deliver to to the end user, to our partners, is something that still needs to be done. But we're already starting to set up our, our squads uh, in a way to to define that mindset so that we can you know try to march in that direction. And then, kind of the last one, which is which is something that is particularly important in 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 agile, is the feedback loop. Um, you know, you do work, you put it out there. And then you get the feedback and you listen to it. And based on the feedback, you kind of go through the cycle again. I mean, this is at the essence, you know, of, of all that we do. Um, some of the things that we've already done, we talked about sprint reviews already, the integration of the feedback from people that are, you know, even our previews to customers or something that we already uh, have been doing. We're also starting to, you know, get a better understanding during our retrospectives of our velocity, you know, uh, how we do, uh, you know, our story point assessments, trying to use that to improve our practices. We're also now providing a lot of emphasis uh, on the robustness of our continuous integration, continuous testing, and continuous delivery. Um, This is, uh, we do have these tools. Uh, They're not really supporting us in the way we want. And so we do want to to, to do a much better job there is to, to have this machine that is just uh, supporting engineers and in increasing their, their, their throughput. And then being able to use dashboards that allow them to understand when there's things broken in the system and, and so that we can respond more quickly uh, to any beta breakages. So we're putting a lot of focus into that system uh, and we're trying to find better ways to collect data from partners. That's a key thing to, to our feedback loop, uh, you know, our partner feedback loop. Exposing our partners, uh, our uh, our developers, and our engineering team to partners, something that's very important. Um, and of course, one of the key things is, is uh, you know, one to just to reinforce some of the things that we're doing within engineering with this feedback loop that Gavin talked about is how can we find ways to increase the frequency in which we release our product. So. You know, if we're talking about uh, providing a, a fix to a bug in 30 days, we need to be able to, to release 
you know, bugs uh, or 90 days, we need to be able to release at least within the 90 day uh, cycle. But of course we want to do that much slower. So 30 days to fix, 90 days to release. Sorry, make sure I don't uh, create some confusion there. <clears throat> so, I mean, in summary, I mean, I do want to drive this point home. Don't look at us and say, geez, you guys are awesome. I wish I was tech soft that, you know, what you're doing all is great. There's probably a couple of people on this call. If I, I let them have the, a word, they would, you know, probably put me down to, to, to more down to earth, but this is a long road. And, you know, it is something that uh, we are already seeing some, some payback of the investments that we're making. Like in the last year, if we were to talk about the pain to release our products, in some of these products, the decrease in that pain was pretty significant. I mean, we would sometimes require, you know, several weeks in order to be able to stabilize a product, have people, you know, doing long hours and, and hard work to stabilize it. We are able to reduce that. And that's a pretty significant change. And it does come from these practices, not exclusively, but it does come from some of these changes. We do see an improvement in quality. I mean, it's not a, a direct, you know, correlation. There's not a direct connection, but it, it, with some of the practices, with some of the definition of done, the definition of ready, we have improved the quality of the product and added a lot of teamwork and collaboration, sharing of knowledge and improving predictability. It's a very wee little thing. I mean, it's not something that we can really, uh, uh, you know, uh, present as, as a big win, but it is, you know, we start to see you know, slightly that uh, we are starting to become a lot more predictable in terms of what we can deliver. Uh, and that's, that's a good, that's a good message uh, to, to have. So just to kind of wrap things up, uh, just to come back full circle to where we started, I just wanted everybody to kind of keep in mind that, you know, agile transformation is not easy. It takes a lot of hard work and persistence. It's not just hard work. You got to keep at it. If you, if you let you know, picture yourself pushing that boulder up. If you just let go one bit, you know, you're gonna get crunched. So yeah, you do need to persist at it, but it can be done and it will work for you. Uh, trust me, I've, I've seen it enough times and, and I'm pretty confident it will. So to kind of wrap things up, I do wanna thank, uh, thank you guys uh, for your attention, guys and gals. Um, I had kind of planned it's a Q&A session, but I wasn't really sure whether now would be a right time. We do have some demos. We have some other exciting things to go at. So what I will leave with you is my contacts. If any of you would be interesting to chat about this topic or want to know more, or just kind of bounce ideas off me, you know, it is a topic, topic I'm very passionate about. So you could reach me by email. You can look me up on LinkedIn and, you know, we can chat then. <clears throat>